Welcome to Blue Line Lore. I'm your host, Cobalt Blue. You can just call me Cobalt. I invite you to join me as I conduct interviews, analyze data, and dissect media on a variety of topics concerning American law enforcement and the ever-evolving society that we are tasked to defend. My hope is that thoughtful, earnest discussion of these topics will better equip us all to form a more perfect union within these great United States of America. Settle in as I delve into the past, present, and possible future of American law enforcement. These are the Chronicles of Blue Line War. Welcome to the Chronicles of Blue Line Lore, or welcome back for those of you returning after consuming our pilot episode. I am, of course, your make-believe host, Cobalt Blue, here to discuss the very real tribulations faced by American law enforcement and the people we serve. Here with me today is Lieutenant Thomas Amaro out of Richland County Sheriff's Office in South Carolina. LT, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, good afternoon. And on behalf of Richland County Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Leon Lott, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today um, about Project Hope and Project Lifesaver. How long have you been with um, Richland County Sheriff's Office, sir? A total of uh, 43 years. Wow. And did you just start on in patrol or jails like everybody else, or...? Yes, sir. I uh, started on patrol um, back in 81 and worked my uh, way up to uh, investigations um, to um, supervisor positions. And then uh, back in 2019, um, we took over the unit called Project Hope and Project Life Lifesaver. Um, Project Hope stands for Helping Our Precious Elderly. And um, like I said, I'll go in further detail, but I took over right in, almost in the beginning of the, the, the pandemic. And I'll give you a little bit more information about that later on. Yes, sir. You answered the question we had planned, of course, what does Project Hope stand for? But what does this service of the Richland County Sheriff's Office provide for your jurisdiction? We um, do a lot of things as far as um, helping our senior citizens. The main goal is not to make sure that they are taken care of because, once again, coming back to the pandemic, we found a lot of uh, seniors were basically isolated, meaning to the effect that they were alone. Um, so they didn't have anybody locally here in the, in the Richland County, Columbia area um, to take care of them. Our main goal was to make sure um, they were not isolated. Um, and uh, unfortunately, during the period of COVID, um, we, we had to um, limit our visitations because of that, but we were still making contact by phone, or for that matter, um, we would go by the house, talk the horn, me, um, greet them um, outside the yard and just see about their well-being and make sure they're okay. It's incredible that you founded this in 2019. That was just in time for the pandemic. And of course, no one expected the lockdown to happen. Your program couldn't have come at a better time. So thank you on behalf of the seniors of Richland County. Your webpage states that your senior coordinators are all retired law enforcement. And you, of course, are active sworn yourself. I would like to thank all of them for their continued selfless service to the County of Richland. How many active sworn deputies are involved in Project Hope, though, either in official capacity or as off-duty volunteers? Are there quite a few? Yes, sir. Myself and I have a sergeant who's um, a Class 1 officer. We have about eight um, part-timers, um, retired uh, law enforcement officers, and we have about six to seven civilian um, part-timers, also known as senior coordinators, who assist us in Project Hope. In addition to their service, of course, you said there are some who help part-time even after they get off work. I think that's incredible and it speaks to the selflessness of the sworn peace officers in, in your department, sir. Of course, we also have um, what we call telephone volunteers who assist us to making phone calls to our seniors. Basically, we have two, three categories. We have our clients. They may want to receive just a phone call only, or they want a phone call and a, a visit, or they may just want a visit. So we try to accommodate uh, our seniors um, to wherever they might choose at that point. That's phenomenal, the modularity to the service to you know, tend to the needs of each individual person. Were there any unexpected hangups or difficulties when founding Project Hope, and how has the service evolved over time, perhaps as a result of these obstacles? Some of the things were, of course, earn the trust of our seniors because sometimes um, they may not have trust in their, in their in their lifetime. Sometimes their relatives, of course, would basically then care about their well-being, or for that matter, they would be taken advantage of where the relatives would only be concerned about the benefits they may receive. For example, we had a situation one time where we had a gentleman um, who was living in a trailer, and lo and behold, uh, one of our uh, senior coordinators went by there 
you could actually see the ground and the flooring of his um, bathroom. We took um, a role to make sure we contacted another organization to take care of him. We got the money from the person who was supposed to be taking care of him, and we got another um, caregiver who would um, take the proper steps to make sure he was taken care of and not taken advantage of. It is highly unfortunate that there are enough situations like this to warrant the regular intervention of a program like Project Hope. Well done, though. Along the lines of protecting the Palmetto State's senior citizens, what is the connected Project Lifesaver, and how is it related to Project Hope? In two ways. Um, for seniors, for example, unfortunately, once again, they're in that um, age group where, unfortunately, they develop medical issues, uh, such as Alzheimer's or um, dementia, or for that matter, they may be a situation where um, they may be taken uh, medical, through medical um, issues, maybe a stroke or a TBI, traumatic brain injury. Yes, sir. Um, they may wander away. And we have the program through Project Lifesaver where we put a bracelet on, uh, on their wrist or their ankle, and if they should wander away from their home, we use the equipment that we have to make, locate them so that we can safely return them back to their um, loved ones. Sounds like a very necessary service in some cases. The Ridgeland County Sheriff's Office website states that Project Lifesaver has a 100% recovery rate for these elderly folks with nearly 3,000 rescues at the time it was posted. Has that number changed at all since those numbers were put up, to your knowledge? Uh, yes, sir. We've, ha we've had a couple of additional ones where um, they wandered away, probably about three. We actually had a gentleman he was actually um, out of the program. He was actually going to an assisted facility. What had happened was that, fortunately for us, he still had the bracelet on him, and uh, we were able to locate him after I was notified about it. An hour later, we, he was located um, downtown Columbia. That's quite a relief. How far away was Columbia from his household, give or take? The facility he was at to his um, home, his previous home, was probably about four or five miles. He got out quite a ways then. Yes, he did. Good thing Project Lifesaver was there for him. Any other anecdotes about Project Hope or Project Lifesaver that your office is comfortable sharing with us? We do love a good story. You're at Blue Line Lore. One day, um, well, we had a situation just the other day where we had a terrible storm and um, in the uh, Blythewood area of, of Richland County. A uh, lady calls up. She's in, she's in Project Hope, and she couldn't get out of the driveway. So um, I've, I've made it over to her house, and of course, yes, in fact, uh, the the limbs to a big tree, a magnolia tree, had fallen down in her driveway, and so I'm sitting there like, okay, well, uh, I see you, you definitely can't get out. So luckily, I had a um, handsaw with me in my car, and it took me about a half hour, but I was able to um, um, get get enough out of the way for it so she back up. It may seem trivial to us, but for someone who's in the 70s and 80s. Um, there could be a medical emergency, and, she, and you can't get out. It can be a life life threatening event. No doubt she appreciated the save. Any other stories? About two years ago, we had a lady in her late 70s. She was actually uh, accusing one of her neighbors of stealing her mail. At that point, what we also try to do in our program, we have uh, uh, at least a minimum of two emergency contact at this point in time, especially if we can get a relative's emergency contact number. So that way, if something should happen, we can make sure that we do contact them. Uh, we did do that, and I got another call one day where she actually... Um, um, has slipped off the couch, but she couldn't get back up. So I went over there to help her to get back up. An action like that could have possibly saved her life. We, we don't know. It's the same thing for those of us who deal with elderly suspects or elderly inmates. Sometimes those little things that don't mean much to a 30 or 40 year old, like you said, can mean the world to an 80 year old. It could mean their life. That is, that's correct. And you know, a lot of times too, unfortunately, what we deal with, um, especially seniors, it may be something simple as not being hydrated. We've had a lot of cases where uh, a person doesn't drink enough liquids during the day. It can be a situation where, once again, for us, we may be a little bit um, thirsty or something to that effect. But for them, um, 70, 80 years old, if they fall out, they can break their hip or, or worse, hit their head. Terminology check two, fall out. Fallout is not just a long-running video game franchise with a popular spin-off streaming show, nor does it only refer to nuclear fallout. In a military context, the jargon of which is subsequently borrowed for police and fire academies, fallout is a command given to exit a proper military formation, usually with a facing movement. Fallout is the command the leader of the formation gives to allow the service members to leave the formation, 
and the term can also be used as a verb to describe leaving the formation. The connotation is neutral, it's simply giving a command or describing an action. In a more negative context, falling out can refer to a service member or academy recruit on a formation run who leaves the formation due to personal fatigue, being no longer able to keep the pace. Trust me when I say you do not want to be the boot, academy recruit, or soldier in training who falls out of the formation runs. With the above definition in mind, first responders and military veterans also colloquially use the term to describe the act of falling unconscious, as the lieutenant did here. Like I said, it is one of the things that we want to make sure that we're aware of. Once the neighbors knowing that, uh, keep an eye on their neighbors, um, that's one thing we also want to make sure that we spread the word out, when, especially when we have events, for example. We try to stress that to uh, folks who may uh, have someone in their, their neighborhood that we'll, we could be available for them and or just to make sure they are uh, keep an eye on their neighbor. It may be a situation where, for example, um, they see a newspaper in the driveway or they don't hear from their friend, you know, call us. Um, not uh, not particular us for, per se, but the sheriff's department or the police department and do a welfare check. That's all it takes, one call. It's a bit of a cliche, but there's a reason they foot stomp, see something, say something. In this case, it, it could be a matter of exactly. life and death. I read on your website there are instances where protective custody may be necessary for these elderly folk. Have you had many instances where that protective custody has been necessary to preserve the life or quality of life of a senior citizen through Project Hope? And what does that process look like? We've had several cases, but I'll give you one, for example. I was actually in Charleston, and I got a phone call from a relative saying they had come by her home, and there were some flammables on top of her stove. And that's a major concern at that point in time um, for a person where their house could catch on fire. Right. So it was, it was at this point where, um, and unfortunately, the relatives you know, lived out of, out, of, out of town, and we had to do what we call an uh, emergency protective custody. We have another unit, dovetails of our unit, where they do um, um, uh, emergency protective custody and or they get involved with uh, Department of Social Services or Adult Protection Services. Because our main goal is to make sure that we have to look out for the, uh, the adult who is possibly may not be able to take care of themselves. We do try to make effort to get a hold of a relative, but if for some reason they can't take care of their um, their um, loved one, then we have to step in and make sure they are taken care of. Yes, sir, and I imagine that's probably often a very ugly situation when protective custody is necessary, but again, it, it was necessary in the cases you described and probably in others as well, so thank you for dealing with the ugly side of that business. Yes, sir. And like I said, one thing we, we try to make sure that they're aware of there's other opportunities where they can go to probate court or go to mental, mental health um, and at that point in time and um, make sure that, you know, it, it, like I said, it all starts with, you know, uh, on the front end because it's easier on the front end than on the back end. During the pandemic, unfortunately, we were in situations where someone had to go to the hospital. They may be out in the emergency room. We, um, we had one person had to wait almost six hours, eight hours before they can get a bed at the hospital due to the pandemic. That sounds like a very scary situation to be in as a senior citizen, sir. If I may turn things to the lighter side, what kind of volunteer work can volunteers expect to do in Project Hope, broadly speaking? We have people who uh, um, volunteer their time to make telephone calls to our volunteers. Um, we have some other volunteers who um, we have in events. They may volunteer for, um, you know, our, when we have senior events in the community. In fact, we got at least a minimum of five this, this month alone. And um, like I said, we, sh we share information at these um, events, especially when it comes down to the uh, older adults are the prime uh, arena for scammers. Here recently, just in Richland County, we had a gentleman who lost, I think, around $8,000 due to a romantic scam and or uh, the grandparent scam uh, or, or other matter, other kind of financial scams. So we try to enlighten our seniors to make sure when in doubt, call us. We'd be happy to go ahead and explain to them what to do to avoid getting future um, scammers, getting them, or if they become a victim of a crime, of course, we use a rule of if, it, if you don't report it, it didn't happen. And we want to make sure, once again, on the front end, they notify law enforcement as soon as possible. So that way, they can go ahead and get with the bank or financial institution and try to get their relief and maybe uh, credit it back to their accounts. That's very important work, LT. We forget sometimes, as 
government employees that not every senior citizen has a steady retirement, so a financial scam for someone at that age could be devastating. That being said, if there are any prospective volunteers for Project Hope listening right now, uh, where would they sign up? We can put the link in the description. It's uh, little letters, uh, P Hope, H O P E, at rcsd.net. Once again, I'll be P as in Paul, Hope, at rcsd.net. And what they can do is go to our website, www.rcsd.net. Dot net, and in there they go to our um, services under Project Hope, and they can click on that, and we have a link to for our volunteers. They'll fill fill out a background um, application, and then uh, once they do that and they're approved, we'll go ahead and make contact with them to um, set them up for uh, as a volunteer. If another law enforcement entity wants to connect with the RCSD in hopes of adopting the Project Lifesaver program to their own jurisdiction, who do they reach out to? What is the best contact information for this person or people? This project um, Lifesaver, they can go directly with their um, website. It's um, HTTPS, um, the double dot, then backslash, backslash, projectlifesaver.org. Or just look under the website, Project Lifesaver International. And uh, as far as training and what that needs to be done as far as, you know, setting up a program in their area. And right now, for us, um, we have Project Lifesaver, uh, Kershaw County, which is adjacent north of us, um, and Lexington County, which is um, east of us, have Project Lifesaver. And there's other organizations in um, um, South Carolina that also have Project Lifesaver. And there's a website under Project Lifesaver International that will give um, other jurisdictions that will have it also. That's excellent. And um, Project Hope, say someone in another state wanted to perhaps emulate Project Hope, would they contact you, uh, Sheriff Lott, or would it be someone else? Either way, um, they can go to, um, directly to uh, Sheriff Lott, um, his email address, or, um, of course, get a hold of me at Project, um, Project Hope. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll put those links in the description as well, just in case other law enforcement entities want to emulate this. It sounds like a wonderful program. To be transparent with our audience, this question is off script, but we both agreed on this before the recording. You recently went to a funeral for your S.H.I.E.L.D. sister at the RCSD, who lived a good life but is no longer with us. Would you like to take this opportunity to tell us about your friend? Um, she was in her 80s, and um, she worked in my unit for when I was here for at least about four, four years. Unfortunately, she developed medical issues, and um, which included cancer. However, um, and earlier, uh, back in the 90s, um, she was unfortunately um, shot by um, a spouse, uh, making her a, 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 a victim of a, a domestic violence. She was a survivor. Um, she had tremendous willpower. She was just a elegant, elegant lady. Um, and she was a workaholic. She was a perfectionist. Perfectionist, and um, she was very, very out, outgoing and outspoken in some ways. But she helped our community by going out for our seniors and um, giving her her not only her time, but she would help out our our seniors by you know giving them some food or for some sometimes helping them some um, some bills. And like I said, um, she was just a wonderful, wonderful person. And like I said. Um, we're going to miss her, and but like I said, she was just a, a fantastic person, and I know it's like a cliche, but um, they broke the mold when they made her. Sometimes those are the best kind of partners to have. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, sir. I will go ahead and put her name out there and just mention Sylvia Allen Utz, who was, of course, one of our S.H.I.E.L.D. sisters on the Blue Line, and did a lot of wonderful things from what you described. I'll let your words speak for her. You knew her. I did not, uh, unfortunately. Sounds like she was a wonderful person, and from what I can tell, sir, so are you, LT. Um, are there any other topics you'd like to mention before I sign off, sir? Once again, I, I, I want to thank, you know, Sheriff Leon Lott for giving me an opportunity to work in this this unit as Sheriff Little um, Sidebar. One event we had, um, I was talking to people at, at the event, and one of the gentlemen, I think his name was Mr. Felder, kind of find out he was actually the pallbearer at JFK's funeral. Um, and like I said, that's one of, one of the unique things about working in this unit is that we have living history. It's just like 
our vets. Uh, my father was a vet, um, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam in the Navy, and uh, he's a chief. Each and every day, we lose several, several of our vets. In fact, speaking of a vet, we actually have a, a liaison at our church department. is direct link with a VA, and um, several of our um, seniors, for example, um, we share that information. So that way, uh, we had a gentleman um, at one event that I had here recently at the state fairgrounds. Um, he didn't realize um, about his VA benefits, and we were able to link him up to make sure that he received everything he deserved. That's excellent, sir. We love our veterans here at Blue Line, Laura, and not just because some of our human staff happen to be veterans, and I guess I count too. With that being said, Lieutenant Thomas Amaro, we so appreciate your time here. Thank you so much for what you do. I appreciate that even in the twilight of your career, you are helping people in the twilight of their lives. Thank you so much for being an exemplar of the Blue Line and all that we stand for. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, sir, and you have a wonderful day. In my brief time traveling the country so far, I have already spoken with people in this great nation who have asked me, in good faith, what community or social services could law enforcement possibly provide that could not better be executed by social workers or medical personnel? It's a fair question from people who haven't had good experiences with us and perhaps don't know anyone who has. Project Hope and Project Lifesaver are just two of many answers to that inquiry. The former especially requires law enforcement participation. Without arrest powers that are unique to sworn peace officers and some very specific supporting staff of said peace officers, there can be no protective custody, as was necessary for the elder who had flammables on her refrigerator. There are also acute instances of elderly abuse that cannot be halted expediently absent an arrest, and this is certainly still true in jurisdictions that do not have programs similar to Project Hope or Project Lifesaver. In the latter's case, if a missing senior is kidnapped or otherwise held against their will by force, well, I would certainly want the deputies to be looking for me if I was in danger, not that a seven-foot robot who weighs over a ton is prone to being kidnapped. Thus, a police presence is necessary for such community programs to be successful in righting some very ugly situations. Project Lifesaver and Project Hope are also just two examples of many among community policing initiatives that have a tangible effect on a micro and macroscopic level. Project Lifesaver, in particular, is especially convincing from a quantifiable standpoint. Make no mistake. On a personal scale, I am certain that a senior citizen and that citizen's loved ones are individually grateful to the RCSD when they are reunited after the former is lost and subsequently found by deputies. But on a larger scale, over 3,000 instances of missing seniors with a perfect success rate in rescuing them is a statistic that cannot be dismissed. I am so grateful to the Richland County Sheriff's Office for scheduling this interview about these great programs. The Blue Line Lore crew took the liberty of checking out Project Lifesaver's website, and as I'm showing on screen right now, there's already quite a bit of coverage in the United States. However, upon closer examination, there are some spots that are relatively untouched. This isn't to say that there aren't similar programs in place to help the elderly in these parts of the country, but Project Lifesaver itself is not present in said parts as of this recording. If any representatives of a law enforcement agency are watching right now, please do not hesitate to contact the RCSD or Project Lifesaver if you aspire to implement their program for your respective jurisdictions. Links are in the description, and you can message our channel directly if you need Lieutenant Amaro's personal contact information for any professional reason. One last unrelated note before I turn you loose. He and I touched on this before filming started, but around the time we sat down together, the press was covering the horrific shooting in Charlotte, North Carolina, that left four peace officers slain at the time of this monologue's recording. Additional reports confirmed that, sometime after the suspect killed these innocent men, after negotiation had failed, additional forces engaged the killer and shot him down. The necessity of policing is not just a hypothetical, so while I appreciate good faith questions from people who are cynical of our profession, and so far they have all been in good faith, I do ask that some of the more pointed generalizations about us be kept out of the comments section just for this video, if in fact this video gets any online comments. Much like how any four seniors who might be aided through Project Hope are four instances of entire communities resting easy because a treasured member is cared for, these four sworn officers lost are four personal circles torn apart over the loss of their respective contemporaries. Toward the beginning of every season of Blue Line lore, 
which coincides with the Gregorian calendar to begin with January. I intend to read off all the names of the peace officers lost in the line of duty from the previous calendar year, and I will read the names of these men at that time. It is possible, sadly, that some of the injured officers may end up joining the list of the fallen by that time. But like with Sylvia, they will be remembered and honored as shield siblings of the Blue Line for as long as there is a Blue Line. My deepest condolences to their families, and thank you all for listening. I'll see you in the next one.